Good morning, everyone. We've got a great day to worship the Lord. Happy Sabbath. Can we get the uh, deacons to close those doors and in the foyer? That's the only French word I know today. And uh, if we can do that, we will get going here. Thank you so much. My name is Pastor Bobby McGee. You're on television today. I, you, they won't see except the back of your head. But uh, we're happy that you're here. It's a beautiful day outside. It's been freezing cold, and now, even though the Buckeyes won and we're all happy, we still have to deal with the weather. So just for a moment, if you take your bulletin out, and I will highlight a few things that I think that we need to uh, concentrate on over the next few days. And uh, there are people who are watching these things, so uh, while it's happening, uh, make sure you mark. Thanks for closing the doors. Right here, this is a huge item right here. I, I'm asking for Mrs. Adineron to come up here, and I don't see her right now, so I'll wait till, till she gets in here. But until she does, this program, uh, mark it down next, the first weekend of February is going to be our school program, WAA, Worthington Adventist Academy. In there we'll have a marvelous time and we're going to have some great treats from our school. I want you to mark it down and come if you can, okay? That's February the first week of Sabbath. The second one is an all-church Valentine's Day program. This is not a couple's program. Do not say, oh, I don't have a date. I can't come. This isn't about that. It's about you coming, the church honoring you. Please, if you're an elder or a deacon, you really need to be there because I introduce people to our leaders, and I need you. Come on up, Debbie. Debbie Dinneron is our home and school chairperson, and I appreciate her and her family. She's actually done, or she and her husband have gone out and made a beautiful big family, and we're hoping for more family. Can we say, hello, Sister Debbie? Can we say that today? And share with us about this right here, Sister. And I'll hold it up in there. Hello, church family. Um, the last time you saw me here in front of you was in November of 2013. And it's for something similar to what um, I'm here for again. But first, before I talk about what we're going to do this year, I want to be grateful. I want to show you appreciation, tell you that I really appreciated how you came through with what we did in 2013. That was when we had the candle fundraiser. And you all came through, you purchased the candles, the school raised money, and we really thank you. Because before we come and ask you for one more thing, we need to really let you know that what you're doing, we appreciate. Amen. And I've been running up and down the stairs, so if you, if you hear the breathing, it's because of that. I'm sorry. Uh, so this time around, the invitation that we've been handing out to you is for um, a program that we've put together. It's the very first of its kind. WAA, Wellington Adventist Academy, is uh, putting together a program that we call Valentine Family Valentine Event. We are asking you to come for a nice night where we're going to have dinner, where we're going to um, the children can see a movie, and people can um, meet and greet and interact together. And also, um, we will have music. It's going to be a beautiful night. Night. We're asking that when you come, you dress nice because we want to take a picture of you and your family. And we can give you the opportunity to get a copy of those pictures um, after the event. Now, it's a fundraiser for the school as well. So we're asking that if you are 15 and older, you give us a donation of $20 for this. And if you are... Um, 14 and younger, you give us a donation of $10. Um, the night promises to be a really fun night, and we look forward to seeing you there. One thing that I want to also say before I leave here is that the school is a ministry of our church, and no matter how you look at it, we have responsibility both to ourselves and to God to do what we can 
and support. So this is the, the, the mind that I need you all to have. And I know we do come to you every now and then, but it is what is expected and God depends on you. But as well as it depends on, as much as it depends on you, he provides your needs. So take this $20, trust in God, and expect his blessing back. Thank you. Thank have you. a happy Sabbath. It is a joy to have the Adiniron family in our church. They add so much, and their children are just wonderfully beautiful, and are, we're so grateful that they are here. And as she said, you don't have to have someone at the school to come to this program. You can support it, as she said, a ministry that helps our church grow. And it, our school is really doing well. The teachers are just excellent, and things are happening. Okay, here we go. There's one other thing. Uh, as you look at the bulletin, you'll note that today, not just is God's holy day, Sabbath, but it is also a remembrance of the celebration of Martin Luther King Jr.'s contributions to our society. I am grateful for Dr. Martin Luther King. People can come up with all kinds of things to say about every kind of leader, but what he did and how he led is still helping people today. And I want you to know that as a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Dr. Martin Luther King helps me and the church I belong to as much as he helped any other color of person. We should be grateful, and I am thrilled that he is a role model for the science of freedom of religion. We benefit, folks. We benefit. I know Julian will say more about this as much, but this is a huge day to celebrate, and I am grateful for that. In fact, I am so grateful that I'm going to go with the Mount Vernon Academy on Monday to watch the Cavaliers and the Bulls play in remembrance of that day, too. So I'm really excited about that. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. We have Bible studies on Wednesdays. We have Bible studies on Thursdays. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you for your ministry of love and learning the Gospels. Thank you. Sign up. Circle it. Invite. Share these opportunities. We have things that can help people. Uh, there will be uh, this Lego Robotics celebration tonight in the Fellowship Hall. Huge Lego Robotics. Our kids at our school get to know more about some of the cutting edge things in math, science, and because of our school, because Sherry Babcock and others. So man, I'm excited to know these kids are learning and we should be very proud of that happening. Okay, now I know that you guys are writing things down, but today, if you're wondering why the choir is not here, our dear brother, our dear brother George is not feeling well today. So we'll pray for him. Maybe draw him a little little line and say, uh, and say, sorry, they're not feeling well. So none of us are feel confident enough to direct the choir in his stead. So we're going to save you from that. But he'll he'll be back. Hopefully, he'll be back. Okay. Another thing that before is, is can we sing can we sing the song first? And uh, we're going to sing this song. But I want you to know that there's a lady named Hilda Addison and her daughter that just happened to sneak in over there. They sneaked in. But they're not sneaking in anymore. Can we give them a big hand for coming back and visiting us right over there? Thank you very much. We, would, we miss you. We know that you live close to another church. We don't forgive you, however, but we still love you. Okay? But thanks for being here today. Maybe, you'll, maybe uh, if, if enough people come up, we won't let you leave. Okay? But at this time, we're going to share a little bit of, of, uh, of our family of God here. Okay? Let's stand up. Make somebody grab that hill over there. And have some left.
Let's remain standing, turn to our hymn, hymn 348. The church has one foundation. The church has one foundation. Everyone sing you with me. Everybody, sing you with me. The church has one foundation. Tis Jesus Christ. On the second sentence, this section over here, come on with me. Elect from every nation, yet one of the earth. I can't hear you. Sing it out. Now you sound better. One Lord, one faith, one birth, one holy name. She blesses what or what holy food and to one hope she presses with every grace endued this side on the third stanza come on folks through with a scornful wonder men see her sorrows though foes would rend asunder the rock Saints, their faith are keeping. Their cry goes up. How long? And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Everybody, sing it now. In toil and tribulation and tumult of her. Beautiful, sing it out. Wait the consummation of peace forevermore Till with a vision glorious Her Lord and I are blessed And the great church victorious Shall be the church and rest this time, it's not in the program on purpose. We're having a special uh, awareness also, not only of Martin Luther King Jr. and the Sabbath, but it's awareness of a great man that's a lot older. And he had a birthday yesterday. His name is Yulian Filipov. And uh, we're going to ask Yulian and his wife to come up here. And I'm, I want somebody with a camera, or several people with cameras, because uh, he's going to want to have a picture of this, okay? And uh, you know I've always got something in store for some of Carolyn, are you going to come over here in just a minute too? Uh, we have two gifts for him today. One gift is a monetary gift of uh, a, a nice card. And with Yeah, he likes monetary. Amen. So We all like monetary. Amen. So do I. Your card here. We gave it to him in the first service, and it's the same card, Julian. Now, if you can remember... For, the, for our TV viewing audience, I'd like you to say the exact same words about how you feel about the people here and uh, in this card, and you can recognize it. But before that, we have a, an even greater gift that the first service, they, they, they didn't get it. And it's not anyone's fault except for just the way life is. So I'd like to bring the even greater gift out today. If you turn to your uh, right there. Oh! <laughs> oh. He did not know she was here. Isn't that beautiful to see that look on his face there? Isn't that nice? <laughs> wow. <laughs> what a great gift that is, huh? Yes, I didn't expect that. 
See, we, all, we, we have it going on over here. So Carolyn is going to, at this time, and, and she's going to come to the mic and say some things about you. But I want to say something first, and she's going to do a blessing on, on, on you. Well, I would like to say it's a joy and a privilege to work with Yulian Filipov. And uh, I'm inspired by his, by his words. But you know what? I mean, no offense. I'm, I'm not, it's not his words that inspire me. It's his life that inspires me. I mean, I like his words. But if he didn't act cool and nice around people, I've, I've heard many ministers say a lot of great stuff. But when they match it up, that's, that's when I really like it. To, to my knowledge and to my life, I admire him as a Christian man. And so I appreciate him. So as, the, as he gets this today, I told him he's too big to spank. But somebody told you what? What did someone say? They were going to they were going to spank anyway, right? Yeah, Ch Charlie promised to spank me, and I thought the first service we have one of our members. Second service people you don't know him, but first service we have a member who is seven feet tall. Yeah, uh, really, seven feet tall. And I said that's a person I can get a spanking from. <laughs> Doctor Loney can do it. Do it, okay. Anyway, so Charlie, he probably can do it too, knowing him. But so th thank God for you and your wife and your daughter and the ministry that you bring. And uh, I think you're 30 or 31. I don't know which, which age it is, but we'll never know. Carolyn, if you can step up here and have a prayer of blessing, and we'll give you the card over here to you. Thank you. Well, do you know how it feels to every time you talk about somebody, you're older than they are anymore? It's amazing that, you know, I could be Julian's mother. And that is a fact that I just can't get used to. <laughs> but, Julian, if you were in Bulgaria today, what kind of a day do you think you'd be having? If you were in Bulgaria. Today? Uh -huh. Well, on several occasions, uh, people from the church, we have celebrated and so on. But uh, I, I guess I've been a love here by the church so much, I, I don't miss being there. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yes. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, I would like to just have a short prayer of blessing, and I would just like to thank the Lord for this wonderful family that he has sent to us to minister to, to our congregation. Um, I don't know when I've been so spiritually fed and truly nurtured by a pastor and their family as I have with Pastor Julian. And Pastor Bob. Can't leave out Pastor Bob. Yes. And I am so excited that your family's gathered here today. And you need to go home and spend time with your uh, family today. Yes. So uh, let's give him permission to cancel whatever he has this afternoon to go home and, and visit with his family. So let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, what a precious thing it is to be able to celebrate another year of wonderful ministry, of happiness, of good health, of more knowledge, and more grace. Lord, we just thank you for sending us Pastor Julian and his family. And Lord, we thank you so much for the continued um, part in his life that he has played in helping us to understand and reaching a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. We could not have been more blessed and we just want to thank you for that. And Lord, I wanna thank you for the family and how happy um, Eulene will be this afternoon to be able to have Laura home. Yes. I know that they have missed her so very much and I am just uh, so thankful that she was able to be here and that you were able to bless their family with such a wonderful daughter. When we look at all of our blessings and we look at how much we have to be thankful for, it's very difficult to be sad and grouchy on such a wonderful day. So Lord, we invite you here in our service today and we just ask that you will keep your loving hands upon this family. Yes. And I want to thank you for this church family and congregation that has helped them to feel so at home in our church and in this country. Yes. Amen. 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 Thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I would like to say a few words. Not that I will not have the chance to, to say even more words uh, in a sermon, but here on the card it says, uh, your church family 
loves you. And you know what? I know it. And, and it's a very good thing uh, for the person to whom you say, I love you, to know it. And I know it, and I recognize that. I've seen it so many times. In uh, the time I spent together with you in your homes, or eating out, or uh, just visiting together, or even visiting you in the hospital. And I would like to tell you uh, something. Uh, uh, it sounds today like I'm a kind of a great person and so on. Uh, there is not a single person that is great unless he or she surrounded himself or herself with great people. And I am only as great as you are great around me. You enhance my ministry in so many ways. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Bobby, Robin, and every single one. I, 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 I'm, I'm afraid if I start mentioning names, I'm going to miss some of you. Each one of you in some unique way enhances uh, our ministry. And I'm so thankful for that. And uh, lastly, I would like just to say that uh, even though uh, I appreciate what you do for me, uh, in the heart of my heart, I realize that I'm only Jesus' donkey. And he's riding victorious. And uh, all these applauses and all this recognition, I realize, is because of him. I would have not been a pastor if, if, if it were not for him. I would have not been called in the ministry if it were not for him. So all your applauses ultimately go up to him because he created me, he uh, called me into ministry. He was the one wooing me into a relationship with him. So uh, I'm glad and privileged to be Jesus' donkey and today also to bring again to you God's message. So my God bless you all and thank you so much for your love and support. We've got a song of dedication. After the song of dedication today, the children will be meeting with myself and my wife right over in the fellowship hall. So children, we've got a great children's church for you today. And I hope that your parents will be able to allow you to come over there and we'll, we'll have some, some crafts, some goodies, and some Bible time so right over in the fellowship hall. Here's the song for you, Lillian, today. We dedicate this song to you. you I know that you'll, you want to look at the words and hum along and sing, it's okay, all right?
since I'm up here, we have to sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear you, Ian. Happy birthday to you. We're so happy with our pastor, and we all love this church. Amen. Amen. It's time for our morning prayer. As far as possible, you may kneel or sit as we bow our heads. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the Sabbath. You instituted it so many, many years ago for us to come aside and to meditate on you and your goodness. Thank you for all the people that are here this morning and those that are ill, Lord, please bless them. George, our choir director, Tom Esman, Rose Abbott, and all the other people that are having their infirmities and problems. Lord, step in, be with them, be with their families. And Lord, we pray for the day that we can all be with you in heaven where there's no more sorrow, no tomorrow, no more pain, nor anything else that would take away from our glorification of you. In your son's name we pray, amen. amen. At this time, would the deacons come forward for the offering? If you notice the, the jacket that I have on, I'm in mourning for Oregon. This is one of their colors. <laughs> And someone, I was talking to Carolyn, and she said that someone, I've heard several people say that God's a Buckeye fan. I won't go so far to say that, but if he is, I take it, because the Buckeyes are up there. And you know, sometimes you get so high, you can fall, but we're up there this year. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads for their offering. Thank you, Lord, for this time, for the time that we're supposed to give. And we thank you so much for the people that have given so much this year. We end up the year, Lord, in the black. And this is truly a beautiful color. The red is not the color we want to be in. And Lord, we pray that next week we can bring some figures to the people to let them know just how well they have done. And that will encourage them to keep on giving. We praise your holy name. And we don't give to you, Lord, because you need it. It belongs to you in the first place. It's your money. And help us to willfully and cheerfully give it back to you. In your son's name we pray. Amen.
Just before I sing, I'd like to make a few remarks about the man that we honor on Monday, Dr. Martin Luther King. And I can make these remarks because I'm older than most of you, and a lot of these things, I was there when they happened. I used to be sensitive about color when I was a kid, because back then we were colored. But if you look to each other, look to your neighbor. Just turn and look at your neighbor. Aren't we all colored in a sense? And I used to have a, when I was in college in undergrad school at Ohio State, I had a poster in my apartment that said, some of my best friends are colored. And how many times have I heard people say that? And last Sunday when I was out for two and a half hours with uh, Kevin and Rafi and a couple of people directing traffic, one of the ladies said to me, said, you're going to turn into an icicle. I said, well, ma'am, we'd probably have to be a fudge sickle. <laughs> and she, at, at first she didn't get it, but she laughed and I said, hey, it's fine, you know. But I think of Martin Luther King Jr., born January 15, 1929, and he died in cold blood April the 3rd, 1968. He was a proponent of civil rights, nonviolence of all the things this man did. He never raised a fist. He never did any, no slurs, no anything. He was truly a proponent of nonviolence. And 15 years after, after he was assassinated, they finally, uh, legislation gave us the third uh, Monday in January to celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday. And then they gave us February, the shortest month in the year for Black History Month, but that's okay. We'll take it. You guys get the other ones. <laughs> but he was born of a Baptist minister, and he became a minister himself. And as things began to happen, he became of, uh, uh, the head of a Southern Christian leadership organization. We used to call it SLIC back in the day. And he also organized the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which is the younger part of SLIC. We call that SNCC. And the reason why, because I was, back in the day, I donned my beret, my jean jacket, my Levi's, and I became a part of those people who were supposed to be nice to people, but it always wasn't that way, the Black Panthers. However, he continued on with all the things that should have been done in a nonviolent way. Now, some of the things I couldn't understand as a kid, first of all, why were we colored? Because everybody has a color. I couldn't understand when I went to Woolworths with my mother to get a hot dog and a Coke and sit at the counter and the lady said, you can't sit there. I couldn't understand why my oldest brother, who'll be 93 next week, was in the original Army Air Corps before the Air Force, why he couldn't get on a B-17 and fly with some of those guys. And they detached him to Tuskegee, Alabama with those guys down there, and you know who those guys are. And a lot of those things I couldn't understand, but as things began to happen, when Rosa Parks, 15 years old, said, I'm not gonna give up my seat to a white man anymore, when they finally dis outlawed segregation in Baltimore and Washington, D.C., in 1954, I began to understand better. And when they outlawed that, seg uh, when they, Rosa Parks refused to sit, give the white man a seat, then Martin Luther King helped to organize a boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. They almost put, put the, the uh, uh, bus company out of business until they finally relented to give us a little bit of slack. And then the march in, 1963, the March on Washington, D.C., 200,000 people strong. I was in that group of people. What an awesome moment. And as Dr. King began to speak, he got that old Baptist uh, in his voice. And I, he says, I have a dream. And he talked about having a dream where his children would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by their character. And in all those years, the civil rights bill was pushed through. Remember the Ar Arkansas kids, that, the nine that went into the school? They're still alive and all the people that were against them are dead. 
And then all of these things happened. He was there until he was finally assassinated in cold blood. But I remember a lot of the things that happened. I remember at that Freedom March, when he said some, some of the things that he said, we were downtown towards the White House. And I tell you, I could feel the earth move under my feet. It was just so unanimously loud there, to, uh, for lack of a better term. But the thing is, it was unfortunate that President Kennedy was assassinated a few months after that. But it never stopped any of the movements. We had the Selma March for voters' rights. And I think of all the white and black kids that went south on freedom marches that were killed and things like that. But one thing that Dr. King did, he taught us about our blackness. We left that colored phase and went to black. We got rid of that old straight conkaline hair, and I had a huge fro. <laughs> and when I would sing on quartet, uh, on television with the quartet, when we get our heads together, if you pardon the expression, it looked like Afro turf, but it was fine. <laughs> but we had our froes and things like that, and we became a people that knew who we were. And then I never met Dr. King face to face, but I, after the riots were over, and after Resurrection City, I don't know whether you people remember the tent city for poverty and so forth in Potomac Park downtown. They organized a group of black males, 100 strong. We sang on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, Randall Thompson's Testament of Freedom. And we also went to Constitution Hall to sing it. Dr. King's wife was there, and she wanted to meet some of us. And I was one of the people that was able to go and meet her. And I have a book at home, autographed by her. That, and she said to me, she said, Martin would be proud of you guys. And I still have that book at home. But I remember in Resurrection City, one of the things that one of the old black ladies said from Mississippi, she said, Mister, if these people don't get the love of Jesus in their hearts, we'll never have equality on this earth. And that's true. And this is the thing that we have to think about today as we think of his birthday and the celebration of it, what this man did. He's a Nobel Prize, win prize winner. And all the things that people should do, he did, instead of fighting, cussing, and everything like that. And I remember the end of his speech when he said that someday we can sing the old slave song, which we will be able to sing when our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ comes. Help me with it. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty. I'm free at last. There you go. Amen. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Upon the mountain, my Lord spoke. Out of his mouth came fire and smoke. Looked all around me, it looked so fine. Till I asked my Lord if all was mine. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. The Jordan River, Lord, is chilly and cold. It tilts the body. But not the soul There ain't but one train Upon this track It runs to heaven And right back Every time I feel the Spirit Moving in my heart I will 
pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray. Yes, every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, I will pray, I will pray, I will pray. Thank you, Carolyn, and thank you, Bob, for giving us this uh, wonderful introduction into the uh, Martin Luther King uh, story and what actually happened for those of you who have not been around when all these things uh, were happening here. Uh, friends, as uh, our uh, team puts uh, the presentation on the screen, I would like to uh, introduce my topic and to let know those who are for the first time with us, we are in a very deep, deep waters of the book of Acts. And I feel sorry for you because uh, uh, this is a tough uh, subject we are discussing. Last time we finished uh, chapter 7 of the book of Acts that, de that dealt with the martyrdom, with the death, the stoning of the first Christian martyr. And his name was? Stephen. Stephen. And uh, he was stoned because he preached an ex rated sermon and you may ask if you have not been here last time what is an x-rated sermon uh, if we have to rate the sermons as they rate the movies in the movie theater uh, g rated sermons will be appropriate for the general public everybody likes this type of sermons and the moment they walk out of the doors they already have forgotten what the sermon is all about these sermons do not offend anyone but do not comfort anyone either. And you know, the uh, definition of a true sermon is you feed the flock and rebuke the goats. So, uh, this was the g rated sermons. Everybody is happy, it was a good sermon. What was all about, uh, I don't remember. The next type of uh, rating is uh, PG sermons. Those are the sermons in which the pastor may address some of the issues that the congregation or uh, the different people sitting there may have, yet he does it in such a convoluted way that if people come after him after the sermon, he can backpedal and say, oh, the, I didn't mean that, and so on. And then there are PG-13 sermons. Those are a little bit rougher and tougher where the pastor does not backpedal after the sermon. And then there are are rated sermons. These are the sermons in which the pastor tells the things the way they are. People get offended. They go home and say, this pastor has a really poor taste. He does not understand how things, uh, things work. He is not politically correct. We may not uh, increase his salary. Fortunately for me, uh, the local congregation that you do not vote my salary. My salary is uh, uh, voted by the North American division. So, But then, they are X-rated sermons. Those are the sermons which the pastor preaches with his suitcase packed next to him and the moving van waiting outside. Uh, the responses after this type of sermons are horrible. Who in the world ordained this guy? He does, he's not worthy of being a minister. Away with him. And chapter 7 of Acts tells us that Stephen preached exactly such a sermon. After the sermon, he was heaven bound because they stoned him. So today we're going to continue with chapter 8. But before we do so, I would like to go back to chapter 1 of the book of Acts. 
Do you know they often say that the last words of a person are the most important words in his life or her life? And do you know what are the last words of Jesus? The last words before he ascended to heaven, before he left us. Here they are. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be what? Witnesses for me. Where? In Jerusalem, then? Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. These were the last words of Jesus. And did you know that from chapter 1 till chapter 7, the disciples lingered within their comfort zone. They stayed in Jerusalem. For three and a half years, they didn't move anywhere. They didn't go to Judea. They didn't go to Samaria. They didn't want to leave their comfort zone. The outreach of the church actually was so local that if they have continued this way, probably, and if God didn't stir uh, the early church and didn't rock the boat, probably today you and I would have been still pagan. Because the disciples liked their comfort zone. They liked staying in Jerusalem. If it were not for the death of Stephen, and for the organized persecution that followed, the gospel probably would have never spread through Judea and especially through Samaria. Because the Jewish people hated Samaritans. This was the, the hood of back then. This was the place where Jewish people didn't go. And Jesus said, you don't want to go? I'm going to rock your boat because you have to go. I have my people there. So, the gospel might have never reached even to you and me today if it were not for the martyrdom of Stephen. So today, I would like us to learn five lessons. Together we're going to learn five lessons from the persecuted church. And I've titled my message today, Dare to be the church. So please open your Bibles together with me to the book of Acts. Chapter uh, 8, the book of Acts, chapter 8. And I would like someone to lift up uh, his or her hand. And I will need someone to help me out with uh, the microphone. Let me turn this on. And I would like to hear the word of God read by you. Let's hear Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. Please don't hesitate. Mary friend. Oh, okay. So, uh, Shirley, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Mary Fred is going to be the next one. Thank you. And Saul was consenting to his death. And on that day, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men bur buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church, and entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And uh, one more, verse 4. And therefore, they were was, there was scattered uh, everywhere, preaching the word of God. Okay. Um, a persecution arose in the early church because of the X-rated sermon of Stephen. Do you know what PC stands for? Political correctness, not just for the computers, political correctness. I can imagine what some political corrected, uh, cor uh, correct Christian of today would have thought or said about uh, the sermon of Stephen. Stephen's X-rated sermon brought a persecution upon the church, systematic persecution. And someone might say, say today, this sermon was made without any thought. 
There are less inflammatory ways of preaching the truth. Why in the world will you call the Supreme Court of Israel stiff-necked and uncircumcised people? Can't you talk to them in a nicer way? Probably someone today would have thought, because of you, Stephen, now I am driven out of my home, families are torn apart, children are taken away from their families, and we have to live as exilees far away from home. And all of it because of, of your not very well thought sermon, Stephen. This is what some Christians today may think of Stephen's sermon. But when you read the Bible, you don't see a single accusation or grumbling on the part of the other Christians. They didn't blame Stephen. As a matter of fact, they gave him a very honorable funeral. Funeral with honor of a stoned person by the Talmud is forbidden. Nevertheless, they did it. Nevertheless, the early church did it. They didn't blame Stephen for the persecution. And don't get me wrong, friends. While political correctness sometimes may save us a lot of trouble, and it's not always wrong, there are times and places when political correctness will mean betrayal of the gospel. So here is the first lesson we learn from a persecuted church. First, not every hill is worth dying on. Some people are willing to argue and to become obnoxious to the society about different things of their doctrines. I would like to tell you, even though doctrines may be right, not every one of them is worth dying for. But there are times and places when God expects you to die in defending of the gospel. And when those times come, come and you shrink back, it's nothing shorter of a betrayal of our Lord. Stephen understood that and he didn't shrink back. A second century theologian, North African theologian, by the name of Tertullian, says it this way. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. To say it in another way, the blood of the martyrs is how we, the church, got to grow. And I would like to ask you today, are you willing to be the seed of the church's growth? Are you willing to stand on those hills on which God expects you to lay down even your own life for Jesus? And I would like to ask all of us, are we willing as a church to be a church full of seeds for the gospel growth? Do we dare to be that type of Christians? Do we dare to stand for the gospel even though heavens may fall? And then I would like to take you to verse 4. Let's uh, concentrate on what happened when the uh, disciples were driven out of Jerusalem. It says, those who were scattered went everywhere doing what? Preaching the word. I would like to talk about two Greek words that are really important here in this verse. The word for scattered in Greek is diaspero. And diaspero is the word for sowing seeds, for scattering seeds in the field. When persecution came, suddenly the seeds, the Christians, were spread all over. And together with the Christians, what was spread also? Preaching the word. Actually in Greek is evangelizo. They evangelized everywhere they went. Because they were changed by the presence of Christ, they became seeds that were germinating with the grace of Christ. Everywhere they, they went, they were spreading the word about Jesus. Let me tell it another way. It is impossible 
to be touched, to be transformed by the presence of Jesus. And to not touch and transform the lives of others. Maybe not all of them are going to be changed, but someone is going to respond. If the, the seed of God is germinating and growing within you, you're going to influence others. It's impossible to be a Christian and to not change someone. And here, I would like to tell you something that probably is not going to be, be very palatable to us Westerners. God made persecution and suffering serve the Great Commission. Persecution spread the gospel to places where the disciples would not go on their own. And would you please listen to me? I would like to talk to you. Persecution, inconveniences may send you to places you would have never chosen for yourself to go. I guess none of us chooses to be a patient in a hospital. Many of us will never choose for themselves to be bankrupt. Many of us will never choose for ourselves to be homeless and to lose our homes, to lose our security. Yet sometimes God uses this spiritual and material crisis in our lives to send us to places we would have not gone on our own. When was the last time you visited someone in a hospital? Just to go there and encourage him or her. When was the last time you went to the places where people do not have homes? And not all of them are junkies. Not all of them are homeless because they were not prudent. When was the last time you talked to someone who was without a job and lifted up his or her spirit? Does God need to take the blessings away from you so that you'll go to places where otherwise you will not go? God definitely had to rock the boat of the early church so that they'll go to places they will not choose to go on their own. So here is the second lesson. It's a tremendous lesson. Please listen away well and contemplate well and take it by heart. History shows us that comfort, ease, safety, and freedom often bring with these blessings complacency and spiritual apathy in the church. I've seen people during the time of communism who stood firm as rock for the gospel. When they were persecuted, when they were under pressure, and when the freedom and good times came, they stopped preaching the gospel, they stopped influencing people, they stopped going to the places where they would have not gone naturally. And I have a question for you. Are the blessings that God is giving you hindering you in being the Christian that God has called you to be? You remember the last words of Jesus. Go and be my witnesses everywhere. Are the blessings that God has given you an obstacle in spreading the gospel? Have we become so complacent and so comfortable in our own shoes, in our own places, that nothing short of persecution, of spiritual, emotional, personal crisis, of sickness, and so on, will bring us out of our comfort zone? I hope we're going to cherish God's blessings and we'll share them with those who otherwise are never going to hear the gospel. I hope we have not forgotten why we are called to be Christians. We are called to be Christians to be first and foremost witnesses in every place, even in unfavorable for us places, in every place to be witnesses of the love and grace of Jesus. 
one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church by the name of Ellen White uh, sent us this warning. It is in doing Christ's work that the church has the promise of his presence. We pray for God's presence. Every single prayer we offer here, we want God to be among us. She says, it is in doing Christ's work that the church has the promise of his presence. The very life of the church depends upon her faithfulness in fulfilling the Lord's suggestion. Oh, commission. What's the difference? I thought it's the same. Uh, it is in, uh, uh, upon her faithfulness in fulfilling the great uh, Lord's commission that uh, this promise is uh, given. To neglect this work is surely to invite spiritual what? Feebleness and decay. Where there is no active labor for others, love wanes and faith grows dim. And then let's uh, learn a third lesson from a persecuted church. As for Saul, he made what of the church? Havoc. I would like to talk to you a little bit about this word, and especially about the Greek word that is translated in English as havoc. The Greek word lumino literally means a wild beast ravaging and tearing things apart. And uh, in the Greek text of the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, in Psalm 80, verse 13 in the English Bible, uh, we have the same word used for a wild boar ravaging through the woods and tearing at the roots of the trees and knocking them down. So this is who Saul was for the early church, a wild ravaging beast. The zealous Pharisee was the enemy number one of the early church. Do you know what other name is this guy Saul known by? Paul. And Paul is the author who wrote 14 out of the 20, 27 books of the New Testament. You take Saul or Paul away and you have half of the New Testament. Do you remember that the last words of a person are one of the most important things that he has to say in life? Do you know what were the last words of Stephen as he, were, uh, he was being stoned? Lord, forgive them this sin. He was praying for those who were killing him. And one of the people standing there and killing him was Saul, who later became Paul. And here is the third lesson, friends. The gospel has a tremendous power, more than you can imagine. The gospel has the power to turn our worst enemies into our best friends. So please don't you ever give up on your enemies. I hope you are praying for your enemies, because if you're not, you're wasting one of the greatest opportunities that you may have in your life to find your best friend, to find someone who is the best servant of the Lord in the gospel. I hope you take time to pray for the enemies and I know that for some of us or some of us here, our worst enemies are within our families. Do you pray for them? Because let me tell you, you may have given up on them long ago. You may think that they are unchangeable, unconvertible, unrepentable and yet God says you know nothing about my power to change human hearts and I'm so thankful that Stephen prayed for Saul and all who were killing him I don't say that every one of your enemies is going to become your best friend but some will if you pray and you know what this is one of the most amazing things about the, the, the Bible. I'm yearning, I'm looking for it. And I'm gonna, I, I want God to put me at the same place where he's going to resurrect Stephen and Paul. I want to see the jaw of Stephen dropping and hitting the floor. 
when he sees Paul, when he sees Saul, the most honored of all the people in heaven. You know, I want to be there when God resurrects after the, in the day of his coming David, Bathsheba, and Uriah. I want to hear this conversation, don't you? I want to hear how God is able to heal absolutely unhealable wounds in, in the human heart. So don't you ever give up on him. Don't you ever give up on the people that look unsavable, unreachable, because God has a lot in store for them. And he will listen to your prayer, believe me. And now I would like to ask Mary Fran, uh, Bob, where did you go with the microphone? Mary Fran, would you please dig, uh, lift, up, lift up your hand? Uh, Bob does not see you. Here, uh, Bob, on the first row. And let's hear Acts chapter 5, uh, Acts, Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. It's, it's off. Yeah. Let me just see. Yeah. Start on. It's, there we go. We're good. Okay. Let's start over. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, Evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Thank you, Mary Fran. So, uh, this is Philip. And let me tell you, this is not Philip the apostle. This is Philip the deacon. Because all the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. Now, Philip was from a minority who spoke... Hebrew with a Greek accent. He was looked down upon by the other Jewish people as a second class Hebrew. And now that he has become even Christian, he was looked upon as a third class citizen of Jerusalem. And he is the first one who braves the storm to not go to Judea, but to go to Samaria. Because the Samaritans were the most despised people by the Jewish, by the Jewish people. They were considered half-breed. And Stephen, uh, I mean, uh, Philip, Philip thinks to himself, I know how, it, how they feel. I feel the same. I feel like a third-class citizen in, in my own home. I'm going to go to these people. And he went. Now, I would like again to ask you, what was the church's position of Philip? Was he an elder? Was he a preacher? Was he... What, what, what was he? A deacon. Now, he was one of the seven deacons who was ordained... Do you remember for what purpose? To serve tables. Yet, when he went to Samaria, what was he doing there? Preaching first the gospel and then helping people. And listen, friends, this is the lesson here. It doesn't matter what your spiritual gift is. It doesn't matter what your position in the church is. You may be a deacon in the church. You may be a singer. You may be the piano player. You may be a greeter at the door. You may be anything in the church. And you say, I'm not a preacher. But guess what? It doesn't matter. All of us are called to be witnesses for Jesus. The great suggestion, you remember? The great commission was not given just to the preachers. It was given to everyone who calls himself. The first duty of every Christian is to obey the great what? Commission, not the great suggestion. And to become a witness for Jesus. If we do not do that, we are not faithful to the commission to the last word that Jesus left for you and me. And finally, I would like to share with you the last and fifth uh, 
lesson that we can learn from a persecuted church? In verse 8 we read, So there was much what? Joy among the Samaritans. Here is a very important lesson we have to learn. Even though the word of God sometimes may cause us suffering, persecution, inconveniences, ultimately the word of God brings what? Joy. What would have happened if Philip decided to stay away from the Samaritans? Would have they experienced this eternal joy? And here is a lesson for you and me, friends. Sometimes your misery, your suffering, your difficulties in life serve God's mission the best. That's a tough truth to swallow. But sometimes our misery serves God's mission the best. And here is what I would like to tell you. You don't have to like it. I just would like to ask you not to waste this God sent, God permitted crisis in your life. In time of crisis, live for Jesus, love Jesus, and proclaim Jesus. God does not send us crisis. God does not permit crisis in our lives so that we will run away and look for another comfort zone. When you are in the middle of your crisis, stop. Kneel down and ask God, God, how do you want me to proclaim you? How do you want me to live for you through my crisis? How do you want me to take advantage of it and not to waste it? And here is the fifth lesson for all of us. Don't waste a God-sent crisis. Turn your pain into praises and your oppositions and oppressions into opportunities. Sometimes people are going to learn the gospel only when we go through some miseries. Sometimes by getting to the hospital, not as a visitor, but as a patient, we are going to have access to people we are not going to be able to reach ever. Sometimes when we lose the comfort of our home and we lose our home and uh, we get to mingle with people who also have lost their homes. And suddenly, we are ministering in a place we would have not gone on our own accord. When this happens, don't waste a crisis. Live, love, and proclaim Jesus. So at the end of this uh, message, Dare to be the church? Oh, well, just my wife amazes me probably just to support me, not to feel discouraged. Guys, it's a difficult message. Don't think that I'll enjoy preaching it. It's simply in the sequence of what we are studying. Otherwise, I probably would have skipped it. Do you dare to be the church? And that means to believe, to belong, to get, to get together with other people from the church, to become what God has called you to be. And finally, to be sent. To the, God, to, the, to the people God wants you to save. Would you please help me out and take out of your bulletin this yellow connection card? Put at least your name and maybe the uh, email address and then turn it to the back. Turn your connection card to the back. And here are the action steps I would like to suggest. First, I will dare to share Christ, no matter the cost, because Jesus is worth it, and He is the best I can offer this world. Second, I will not waste a crisis God sends my way. With His help, I will turn each crisis into an opportunity to proclaim Jesus and to grow in His grace. And lastly, I don't want to be half-baked Christian. I want to see people around me changing for good because of the Holy Spirit's power in me and in my church. May God bless us in this decision-making. 
May God bless us to dare to be the church, not just to go to church, but to be the church for someone who otherwise is never going to know anything about Jesus and his church. Thank you, Pastor. What an appropriate final hymn, hymn 373, Seeking the Lost. Stand with me and sing. Seeking the Lost, hymn 373. Now, men, this is our song. This is our song. I want to hear the guys on the chorus, all right? Be with me. say if you were singing for rent you would have to move now come on guys help me here and ladies too all right go seeking the lord and pointing to jesus so that our work and burden are gone leading them forth in ways of salvation showing the path to life evermore come on guys Going afar, sing it, seeking the wall, under the back again, seeking the Lord of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb of sinner slain, of sinner slain. Last stanza. This I would go on, missions of mercy, following Christ from day unto day, cheering the fate and chasing the fallen, pointing the law to Jesus the way. Come on now, guys. Going afar, upon the mountain. Bringing the wall under his back again onto the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb, and for sinners slain. Let's sing the chorus now without the organ. This is the truth there. Come on, guys. Going afar. Upon the mountain, see it out, bringing the wonder back again into the fold of my Redeemer, Jesus the Lamb, and for sinners slain, for sinners slain. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Would you please bow your heads with me for the benediction? And then Jesus came and spoke to all his disciples saying, Every authority in heaven and on earth is given me. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you and see I will be with you always even to the very end of this age Amen <laughs>